does it take to disqualify someone from ministry? An affair, spiritual abuse, sexual abuse, abuse of power, or as some have claimed, can just about anyone be restored to ministry because God is gracious and his call is irrevocable? Welcome to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's, and today we're going to take a deep dive into the scriptures used to justify restoring pastors to ministry who have fallen in some of the most egregious ways. We're also going to take a look at how to confront a sinning elder. Does Matthew 18, which tells believers to first go to someone one-on-one -on -one with an offense, apply to these situations? Or is this a misapplication of the passage? We'll also look at the qualifications of an elder, and we'll explore, for example, what does it mean to be above reproach? Joining me for this discussion is Ron Cantor, an author and teacher and president of Shalanu TV. This is such a relevant discussion now, given what's happening with Mike Bickle, the founder of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. Despite Bickle's alleged sexual abuse of multiple women, including some as young as 14 and 15 years old, some are suggesting that Bickle can still be restored to ministry. What do you think? But it's not just Mike Bickle. I've often said it's like whack-a-wolf in the evangelical community. A pastor will be exposed as a fraud or abuser in one location, and then he'll just go underground for a couple of years and then relaunch somewhere else. Is that really God's will? And is that really what the Bible instructs? I can't wait to dive into these topics with Ron. But first, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast, Judson University and Mark Horta Barrington. Judson University is a top-ranked Christian university providing a caring community and an excellent college experience. Plus, the school offers more than 60 majors, great leadership opportunities, and strong financial aid. Judson University is shaping lives that shape the world. For more information, just go to judsonu.edu. Also, if you're looking for a quality new or used car, I highly recommend my friends at Marquardt of Barrington. Marquardt is a Buick GMC dealership where you can expect honesty, integrity, and transparency. That's because the owners there, Dan and Kurt Marquardt, are men of character. To check them out, just go to buyacar123.com. Well, again, joining me is Ron Cantor, a Jewish believer in Jesus and the host of two TV programs, Out of Zion and Get Real. He's also the author of 10 books, and he's the president of Shalanu TV, the only 24-7 Hebrew language TV channel sharing the message of Jesus. So, Ron, welcome. It's just such a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Julie. It's great to be here. And I am so excited to be recording this podcast because I'm getting really frustrated, to be honest, with hearing a lot of people twist scriptures to say something that I don't think they say at all. And I'm excited to get into that. And, and I'm really grateful for you because you've been very outspoken on uh, social media. This is my introduction to you is on Twitter. So, or I'm sorry, X now. Um, but I've really appreciated that. So thank you for, for speaking so boldly. Well, and thank you because I, you know, something I've said for a long time is that when we as elders in the body don't do our job, the Lord will use the media to mm. expose things. And uh, I believe that God has used you to uh, push some things to the forefront. So uh, bless you. Oh, well, thanks for saying that. And we, we usually are the last resort. We are the ones they come to after they've exhausted the elders in their church and all of the leaders that they can they can possibly, that a victim or a whistleblower can, can go to. And, and sadly, you're right. They often... Uh, must come to us. And so that's why that's why we're here. I would love, I've said this before, I would love to be completely uh, unnecessary in the body of Christ and for things to be handled in the church. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon, but I hope, I hope, my prayer is that that will change uh, as we begin doing more things like we're doing today. So we will see. And you've served in contexts like all around the world, like in Rockville, Maryland, which I know where that is. My sister lives in Maryland. I used to live in Pennsylvania. So uh, you were in a, led a messianic congregation there. You've been in the Ukraine. You've been uh, a pastor of a congregation there in Jerusalem. And now you're, you're serving with God TV and, and Shalanu and doing, you know, just amazing ministry. But when it comes to, you know, this topic of pastors who are in persistent sin or, or a, you know, significant fall, uh, I, you know, it's been my experience that we don't deal with this very well uh, within the church. 
Um, but I'm curious, mm-hmm. in your experience, you know, over several decades of ministry, how have you seen the church respond? And, and has it been as awful as a lot of my reporting shows it, it doing? Or um, have you seen some really, really positive examples of dealing with it? Well, I'll start with the negative and, and I'll go to the positive. I think in the yeah. larger charismatic world, we, uh, before I was even born, the charismatic movement started mm-hmm. in the 60s. And, you know, we were, or they were, I should say, I wasn't alive, they were kicked out or, or not received in the mainline denominational world where there were structures of accountability where, you know, you had superintendents and, and you couldn't just do whatever. You didn't have one pastor with all of the power. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of pushed the charismatic world out. And, you know, I don't know if it's the majority, but certainly a large number of charismatic churches are completely independent. And often they have one leader, what what I'll call the royal pastor model. Uh, He's a charismatic figure, probably a very good communicator, good Bible teacher. And, you know, often the elders who surround him are yes men or yes women. Mm -hmm. And they don't really have that level of accountability. And, and, And not just that, they built up or they build up such a aura around their their personality and their calling that when they do fall into moral failure well god forbid that i stop preaching because think of the people that we won't reach of course my mm-hmm. response is yes that's what you should have thought of before you fell into to adultery <laughs> right you know samson mm-hmm. should have thought about that before he got his eyes poked out there there is well we'll get into it later but there is something called being disqualified mm-hmm. now I am very fortunate that when I graduated Bible school, I moved to Rockville, Maryland. I joined a congregation there called Beth Messiah, and they were in the beginnings of forming a network of Messianic Jewish leaders that believe in what we call covenant relationships. So I'm part of a network of, if I include America, 40 congregations, Mm -hmm. and some of the men in that network are my closest friends. And, and they hold me accountable. And we've had a very low number of mor- moral failures. And we have ways of dealing with it if it does happen. Um, as a result, see, it, it, even when you have accountability, and, and we do it, we have accountability. Uh, I can give you the names of men who can ask me anything. There's a man in Haifa named Eitan Chishkov who always, every week, he asks me, how are you doing? How is your walk? When I was working too much about two years ago, he said, I'm concerned about you. I think you're going to burn out. And, and he was right. So we have those type of relationships. And listen, if somebody wants to sin, if somebody wants to commit adultery and they can find somebody to commit adultery with, they're going to do that. But every level of teaching, of warning, of accountability is going to help you not do it. And as a result, you see, I, I look at my, my own life. I, I'm just as able to commit sin as anybody else. I'm just as able to fall as anybody else. Uh, I'm, I'm 58 years old, and by the grace of God, I've, I have not uh, had what we would call a moral failure. And I don't know where I would be if I was brought up in a different model where it was accepted, where divorce was accepted, where you just kind of moved on, you know, you got a little bit of counseling and and continued as pastoring, where you could decide to divorce your wife, marry somebody else, typically somebody in your church, often on staff, and you just keep going in ministry. I I don't even understand that in the culture, and, and it's in the charismatic world that I came up in. Well, I have seen a lot of different structures and a lot of different models. Some are much better than others. Some there is a lot of accountability. By and large, even I've seen local elder boards that say they're supposed to be accountable, but they, again, are often yes men. And so uh, it seems like if a pastor really wants to be held accountable and, and really seeks out that kind of accountability, it's there and, and it can work. But, you know, I I heard somebody say, you can have the best structures in the world. And if you have low character, it's not going to work and you can have high character and have some of the worst structures. Not that structure isn't important. It is really important, but But you can, you can develop high character by being around the right people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate is that I, I, 
I just ended up in this congregation that had this incredible system of leadership training and accountability. Because the truth is, when I graduated Bible school, I was young, arrogant, full of myself, and ready to change the world for me. I was, I was not ready for ministry. Mm -hmm. And I joined a congregation that did not put me on staff. I worked seven years in the secular world, longing to be in ministry, longing to preach. Mm -hmm. But I decided I was going to wait for God's timing. And I was fortunate to be with people who poured into me and helped me develop what I hope is good character. Boy, I love that. I love that that your that your church and you were willing to sort of wait and and work and build that character. And I've often this is another discussion, but I think often the fact that pastors haven't worked in you know the marketplace, haven't done what everyday yes. people do, really hurts their credibility with a lot of folks because you're like you don't understand my world, and and they often don't. But let's get to the situation that we're in right now, and this is the context for this discussion, is we have the International House of Prayer founder, Mike Bickle, who now uh, has received you know, numerous credible allegations that he sexually abused uh, women over, the, over a span of decades, really, um, some of them beginning as early as you know, when they were 14 or 15 years old, so minors, um, just a really shocking uh, situation. And some charismatic leaders have responded by publicly disqualifying him. Now, it took a long time. Uh, I think just earlier this month, uh, Dr. Michael Brown, Jack Deere, and some others, they published a statement permanently disqualifying Mike Bickle from ministry, saying you can be restored to fellowship, but you're done in, in ministry. This is, you know, this is a major, major screw up, and, and, and you're disqualified. On the other hand, We've had some people um, who have kind of gone the, the whole other direction. In fact, on March 3rd, so this is it's not before the allegations came out. This is March 3rd, just uh, you know, a few weeks ago. Rick Joyner, who's the founder of Morningstar Ministries, he had something to say about Mike Bickle. And I'm going to play that clip so we can hear it uh, and what he actually said. So I went up there to see Art mostly, and this young guy named Mike Bickle was there. And Mike's had a bunch of troubles lately, but if you haven't heard, but we believe in restoring people. We believe in Galatians 6, 1, it says, if man's caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore them. We're committed to that. I think you're going to be seeing and hearing from Mike again. All right. Kind of stunning. You're going to be seeing from Mike again and, and some troubles, some troubles. Yeah, um, you know, the, the concern I have about that, and, and again, I'm not here to attack Rick Joyner or anyone else. I want to talk about the principles that we see in Scripture when it comes to these things. But the concern I have about his comment is, and I've listened to that clip many times, is he emphasizes the word any, as mm. if to say, even if you did really bad stuff. And in the situation with my, and my, listen, Mike Bickle was a friend of mine. Um, not best friends, ministry friendship, I'll call mm -hmm. it not mm -hmm. deep accountability, but we, we did ministry together and I loved him. And honestly, I thought he was the last person, uh, that would fall into the type of sins that have been alleged. Mm -hmm. Um, I am still shocked, but the any, when you emphasize any, and then you're talking about Mike Bickle, he, he has allegedly was with teenage girls. Now, that is criminal behavior mm -hmm. in, in, I think, every state in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And um, so he, he's not just talking about uh, restoring him to fellowship. He's talking about having him preach again. And, you know, I just don't see that in Scripture. So let's just take that passage, Galatians 6.1. If you see your, so someone in any sin. All right, time out on you. that. <laughs> I know you want to go to Galatians. Before we do that, okay, Galatians 6.1, because he's not the yeah. only one that cited that. And I want you to look at Galatians 6, 1, and what does it actually say? But there's another one who, who used Galatians 6, 1, which honestly, I was kind of surprised. I haven't heard this used to restore pastors that much. But Stephen Strang, the CEO of Charisma Media, he came out and said something very similar to what Rick Joyner said. So let me play this clip. This was earlier, okay, in, in mm -hmm. his defense. This was January 30th. This was before Tammy Woods had come forward. This is before, like you said, right. the, the, what would be, uh, I think, T.H. was one of the victims as well. 
uh, not identified by her full name, but TH, you know, when she was 15. Uh, so those hadn't come out yet. But we did hear about a woman, the main, you know, Bickle victim, as she was called at the time. We exclusively reported that story of a Jane Doe who said at 19, so she would have been 19, um, Mike Bickle was in his mid-40s, and he had a sexual relationship with her for several years. And that is something that would classify as adult clergy sexual abuse. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, because I know there's a lot of people who are like, hey, she's 19, she's of age, that's consensual, this isn't abuse. Um, let me just play the clip, and then we'll dig into that a little bit. There are some bigger issues that I think we have to deal with, and one of them is should Mike Bickle be restored or not? And let me just give you my perspective. First of all, we want our perspective to be the word of God. And in Galatians 6, 1, it says, Brothers, if a man is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, watching yourselves, lest also you be tempted. And so I believe that the Apostle Paul, writing to the Galatians, said very clearly that people can be restored. I come from a denominational background that has a path for restoration for ministers who are repentant. I grew up in the Assemblies of God, and they, the Assemblies of God, to their credit, have always stood for righteousness, and they're very quick if somebody messes up to deal with it, unlike some groups where it seems they just become more and more liberal and it's almost anything goes. But they also have a way that people can be restored. And I've known a number of people who've been restored, some of them publicly. Uh, Jim Baker went through a period of restoration after he lost everything and even went to prison. He was later exonerated. Um, there's other examples as well. Ted Haggard, who went through a very public humiliation. Uh, he'll never again have the same position of leadership, but he has been restored to ministry. He pastors a church now in Colorado Springs. Yeah, that, that that's very inaccurate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was I was going to bring that up, but you go ahead and point out these yeah. inaccuracies because there are several. And and I reached out to to Steve after I I watched that. I wrote mm -hmm. him a, a a letter explaining. I'm not sure you really. I hope that you don't understand everything that's really happening because if you did, you might not have said that. But uh, first of all, was Jim Baker exonerated? Um, no. I think he got out of jail a little bit early, and maybe they felt that the sentence was too strong, but he, I don't think he was exonerated. And Ted Haggard left his accountability system uh, and said God called him back to Colorado Springs, and only God can uncall him, which is just horribly unbiblical, uh, because it is men who lay hands on you to put you in ministry, and it's men who can sit you down. At least that's what I see in the Bible, and that's what I submit to with the uh, group of ministers that I'm a part of. Jim Baker, you're right. He was originally sentenced to 45 years in prison, and then a judge later reduced his sentence to eight years in prison, and then he got out after less than five years uh, on, on parole. I, I don't think that's exoneration. Um, it's simply a, a judge changed his sentence. He still was guilty. Um, and honestly, when you look at the millions of dollars that he misused, donor funds that he and his wife used, misused on their extravagant living, I mean, when I look at the qualifications of an elder, and one of them is not being a lover of money, uh, that's just shocking to me. That's even, uh, you know, in addition to the allegations of, of immorality that he was involved in. Ted Haggard, too. I mean, stunning to me. Uh, Stephen Strang is, is in media. I'm in media. I find it very difficult to believe that he doesn't know better. I mean, if he doesn't know better, then shame on him. He's completely incompetent in that role. And I know I'm using strong language, but this is ridiculous. What he just said is unconscionable. And either you have your head buried in the sand, which you do not, Stephen Strang. You're you're in this position. You knew you were there for the decades while, you know, Jim Baker, this was going through. I, I, I just I know people want to give him the benefit of the doubt. I, I'm I'm so offended by that statement. And and to me, to bring up Haggard and Baker as an example of why we should restore pastors, to me, it's the exact opposite. They are examples of why we should not 
restore pastures. And Jim Baker, you know, was peddling some, you know, supposed cure of COVID that he got um, <laughs> that he got censured for by the government just just recently. I mean, he's just it's it's again to me just sad and pathetic what we're doing on this. Um, but let me. Let me throw this back to you because I did interrupt you when you wanted to go into Galatians six one, and I know we're dying to do this. Now used by two men in positions of leadership within the charismatic community, saying Galatians six one says to restore a pastor. That that's what you know, and you said in everything, right? So speak to that. Yeah, well, if you read Galatians six one. Uh, it, says you who are spiritual, if any believer finds himself in sin, in any sin, uh, then you who are spiritual should restore him. That There is no leadership context there. If you read the verses before, after, Paul is talking about the fruit of the Spirit before, uh, and then he go, in, in six one he comes up t- to this verse. He's speaking to any believer about any sin. And, and that is true. We... Uh, should restore any believer regarding any sin that they commit, no matter how grievous, whether it is adultery or clergy sexual abuse, we are in the business of restoring people. We are in the salvation. The very word salvation means taking something that nobody else wants and making it desirable again, making it usable again. And in my prayer for Mike Bickle or for anyone else who finds themselves in such a sin is that they would be restored. But there is nothing in that passage about leadership. There is nothing Mm -hmm. in that passage about somebody who is in a position of authority, spiritual authority, preaching, teaching, discipling, uh, an elder or a pastor in a congregation, falling into sexual sin or clergy sexual abuse, and then being restored to that. But it has nothing to do with the context. It's about any believer falling in any sin, and then the the rest of the body going and helping that person, which we believe in it. So Galatians 6.1 is not talking about this. Uh, Let's look at at some other passages. So what what passage would you look to as a, a recipe for how to treat a sinning elder? We have to first ask ourselves is, does the New Testament have an expectation that if a leader falls into sexual sin, that they have the right to be restored to the exact same position? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. There's no scripture in the New Testament that deals with this specifically that says when uh, uh, somebody falls into, has a moral failure, you know, Mm -hmm. they're going to be restored right back into that same position or into a position of leadership. We have to understand that leadership, that preaching, that teaching, it's a privilege. It's not a Mm -hmm. right. And and it is true that if a leader falls into sin and and they're disqualified and they can't go back into ministry, Mm -hmm. then that does mean that people that they would have reached may not be reached. But that is why when we take that that solemn oath to enter into ministry, we, we have to surround ourselves with the tools that we need so we don't have a moral failure. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I beat my body and I make it submit mm-hmm. so that I, after I preach, I will not be disqualified. So if anything, Paul is saying that there are things that can permanently disqualify you from preaching. I do believe that when you commit, and we'll get into it later, what cl- the difference between adultery and clergy sexual abuse. I do believe that disqualifies you. But if you know that somebody is, uh, if somebody has a complaint against an elder, against a pastor, against a teacher, then the Bible is very clear. Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 5 uh, verse 19, that if there are two or three or more accusations against an elder, it has to be taken seriously. It has to be investigated. It has to be dealt with. And then verse 20 says, if uh, the elder is, if it's proven that he has been in sin, then mm-hmm. it is dealt with publicly in front of the church. Sadly, what often happens, and again, th- there's no joy in, in exposing somebody's I- I- private life in front. It, it's the, why do you do that? Because you have to warn the church, this is not acceptable. And then if people know that that pastor had, had that, that, that there were suspicion, mm-hmm. they need to know the outcome. They need to see the integrity of the eldership, how they dealt with that. Yeah. And, and since you brought up first Timothy five, 19 and 20, you know, it says one, that there needs to be 
you know, two or more witnesses uh, of this. And then it says, again, to publicly expose him so that others may stand in fear. Like there should be a level of fear among pastors of falling into sin and that something bad would happen. I feel like this, we have been restoring pastors so much. I, I, you know, I joke, but it's not funny, you know, that it's like whack a wolf, you know, I mean, they, they sin here, then they go underground for a couple of years, then just pop up somewhere else. And we just have them being recycled over and over again. And this playing out in different locations. And I am grateful that we're talking about adult clergy sexual abuse. I mean, there's one thing, you know, does just immorality, does adultery disqualify you? But then on top of that, we have this thing called adult clergy sexual abuse. It's something that's becoming more understood in the church. But you have this power differential between a pastor and a congregant or a staff member. You know, this is their boss or this is their their spiritual leader that they trust. And they wouldn't believe that he would do something as evil as groom them, you know, into sexual sin with him. Um, that, you know, is a, is a level of, of predatory behavior that I don't think we've understood very much in the church. So, I mean, speak to that. You, you see, I mean, I I can tell a difference between an affair that might happen between a pastor and say someone outside his church, um, and actually sometimes in a counseling context, sometimes in a pastoral context, um, either way, you know, a, a position of authority over someone and using that spiritual position as a context to exploit that person sexually. Talk to that. Sure. Let, let me just give a footnote to the last point we brought up. Mm-hmm. Why would a pastor who has had a moral failure want to continue preaching? Like, what, would he not be embarrassed? Would he not be mm. ashamed? And that is often because in our celebrity pastor culture, there is a level of narcissism that is tolerated. And when you are a severe narcissist, and I have seen it in ministry many times, you, 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 there is no shame. You, we see it in politics. We see it in ministry where there's nothing, there's no thing that is too horrible for you to do that doesn't make you want to stay in the public eye. And that's where other elders come in, have to say, no, absolutely not. So what is the difference between just regular adultery, if you will, and clergy sexual abuse? There was the Um, I'm an NBA fan. So the Boston Celtics a few years ago, their coach, it came out that he was having an affair with somebody on their staff in in his chain of authority. Uh, She wasn't underage. She was, they were both consenting adults and yet he was fired immediately. And what is sad is that the secular world seems to understand this Mm -hmm. and we in the church don't. So we, I won't mention his name, but there is a pastor in America who decided he was going to divorce his wife and shortly thereafter married her friend who was on staff and continued in ministry. That would never be tolerated in the world. You cannot engage in a sexual relationship with somebody that you have spiritual authority or in the secular world, any type of authority. Mm-hmm. The reason the coach was fired is because... He was somebody that this woman looked up to. You can't call it consensual when you are adored by that person, when you're looked up to by that person. So when we're inside of the church and you're a pastor, forget a basketball coach and his, his, uh, you know, the chain of command. There's something about a, somebody who stands up in the pulpit with spiritual authority that is attractive and, and, and you trust your pastor in a way that you're not going to trust everybody else. So when your pastor tells you that he loves you, that, that he can't control his feelings for you, that, that it's okay because God showed him. It's not just like meeting somebody at a restaurant and falling into a sinful relationship. That person has now been manipulated and they have been controlled. Or when that pastor begins to send texts, if he's famous with somebody that, that adores him, comes to his meetings, follows his, his ministry. And now she is, un- she's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that he knows who I am or that he saw my text or that he wants to interact with me. And then that moves into a sexual conversation. It's not equal levels. It's not equal playing ground. So, you know, my personal opinion is if a leader falls into clergy sexual abuse, 
then, then that you're done. That is my conviction. That is the conviction or the standard I hold myself to. Um, I would that others would hold themselves to do to, to that standard as well. And particularly in the situation that we're talking about today, there were teenage girls. I know it was 40 years ago, but it wasn't dealt with. And, mm-hmm. and I don't even know how you deal with something like that. It's now you're talking about something criminal. Uh, but yes, clergy sexual abuse is very different than just meeting somebody on a business trip or wherever and falling into adultery. And the question is, too, with adultery, whether you can be disqualified for that as well. And I, I'm going to read the passages on the qualifications for elders in just a second. But there is something, since we, we brought up First Timothy 5, I want to discuss. And that is where it says two or more witnesses. And I have actually heard people make the argument based on that saying, yeah, you've been sexually assaulted by a pastor, but now you need some witnesses who actually saw it. So if nobody saw you get sexually assaulted by this pastor, sorry, you're out of luck. Speak to that. Yeah, I I think that we have to uh, look at, and and I don't want to get hammered here because I'm not trying to change the Bible, Mm -hmm. uh, but the culture that Paul was speaking into was a very different culture. Uh, Women were incredibly devalued in that culture. So everything, you know, like I I think uh, N.T. Wright, I heard him say uh, in his, how he changed over the years in his Mm -hmm. understanding of, of, of women in ministry. He says, you know, where the Bible says women should learn at home, Paul was speaking into a culture where women didn't learn at all. So Mm -hmm. by saying they should learn at home, he's upgrading. So Mm -hmm. it's not apples and apples. Let me just say this. If I want to make the standard stricter for my pastors, I think that's okay. So it's one thing if I'm making it looser than scripture, we don't have the authority to do that. But if I want to say, if you are going to be a part of our congregation, here's our standard. And this is the standards that we're developed as we're watching what's happening. We are developing different standards. We are strengthening our standards in our network. We are now arranging that if anybody in any one of our congregations here in Israel has a, a complaint against a leader regarding sexual sin, that there is an address. If it's a female person complaining, there is Mm. an address of a female. That's the first person that they go to. They don't go uh, to the, we'll we'll get into this in a minute, but they don't go to the pastor that abused them. They go to this female person Mm. and it, which we'll call an advocate. And then that person, there is a series of things that happen where that thing is investigated. So I don't have any problem if if somebody ever made an accusation me against me if it was one person I would immediately call my other I'd call that female once we get that 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 system in place but I would call my other leaders and I would say listen this person saying this about me it, it didn't happen but I want you to hear her and I want you to investigate it uh, so I would never say to a alleged victim of rape. Uh, because there's no witnesses, we're going to just ignore that. Uh, we're going to, at the same time, we're not going to say we 100% believe you. We don't know Mm -hmm. that there's definitely cases inside the church where somebody, uh, gets angry at a pastor, uh, gets bitter and be, and makes up accusation. The issue is we have to investigate all accusations. Well, and I think we have to look to the studies show that there's hardly ever a case where a woman will bring an accusation. Less than 10%. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly low. And people have to understand when they do this, this they're, they're coming forward with one of the most shameful things, even though it right. shouldn't be shameful to them because they didn't do anything wrong, but it, they feel shame. And it's, it's, it, it's humiliating. And they don't want to admit this publicly. And they really don't want to talk about it. And to do that, there's an incredible cost and trauma, a re-traumatizing that happens to the victim. And so yeah. I think we've, we've grown in our understanding to, you know, generally, unless there's a reason not to believe the women, I think we should, that should be our inclination. Well, when, when these accusations were brought mm-hmm. to me, somebody who was on the advocate uh, group had uh, contacted me mm-hmm. just before it became public. Uh, my, what I said to myself, I'm sure these are true. I, I, I didn't, I, that was without investigation. That was based on my experience in ministry. I, I am, again, I've been in ministry almost 40 years. I have not yet seen a false accusation that has come across my desk. Mm-hmm. Um, studies show it's two to 8%. Um, and 
just again, based on my experience, I said, there's more than one. Uh, they're probably true. And they turned out at least two of them have been confessed to and uh, two of them have been ignored. And I think, too, when we look at situations where it says, you know, uh, witnesses, I know as a reporter, we've we've learned, we've grown as a journalistic community on how to investigate and corroborate some of these stories. Like if somebody comes forward to me, I'm going to say, well, did you did you talk about this with anybody like at the time it right. happened? And often, oh, yeah, I talked with this person and that person. And, and you're able to go and interview those people and they can say, oh, yeah. And, and often what they tell, you know, I mean, I've had I've had mothers tell me how their daughter was, you know, throwing up. You don't throw up after consensual sex. You know, I mean, the responses and the trauma that they saw and they witnessed to me, that's those sorts of corroboration. And, right. you know, the character of the person, I think when the, the main Jane Doe came forward in this Mike Bickle situation, there were so many people who knew her character that she was not somebody who would ever make something like this up. And so I think those are ways that we can corroborate with additional witnesses without them actually being there and actually Absolutely. witnessing it. There are ways to corroborate it. And so I, I'm, I'm grateful that we're, we're learning as we continue to grow in, in our understanding of this issue. I want to take a look at the qualifications of a pastor <laughs> or of an elder because they're pretty stinking high. Um, <laughs> First Timothy 3, 1 through 7, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not a violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up. Uh, with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. I mean, that's a, that's a tough, a tough level of qualifications. But, you know, when I look at pastors that have fallen into this kind of sexual sin, I have to ask myself, and I'm going to sound like a hardliner here, but, but, you know, I think of like um, the statistics we have about recidivism with, you know, prisoners coming out, do they reoffend? And, and they're really, really high. I would say from my experience, the cases of recidivism of pastors falling into sexual right. sin again, or especially into predatory behavior, really, really high. Um, I would rather lean to, you know, being conservative about restoring these pastors. And I really do ask myself, can you be above reproach after betraying your congregation, betraying your wife, and really bringing shame upon the, the church, the reputation of the church in a community? Because everybody finds out. This, this becomes public, and it should become public. That's what First Timothy says to do, publicly rebuke this sinning elder. I think you also have to ask, what, what does it mean to be restored? Does it mean actually getting back in the pulpit or is it a, a deep process? Your recent guest, I don't remember his name. He was a, a PhD. David Pooler. Yes. Yes. He uh, talked about that when you are, first of all, he said it's the exception, not the rule restoration to ministry. But then he said that the restoration process, it's not, you know, it's, it's so often, you know, just take a break. Even if it's a year, you're not just taking a break. You're, you need to see a trained counselor or a group of counselors. Uh, it, it should not be an easy thing. It should not be the, well, I'm going to take a sabbatical. I was overworked. And you are right, because the cases of repeat offenses is, is just way too high. And so, again, I don't see anywhere in the New Testament where there's an expectation that a leader who has a moral failure would be restored. But if that happens, there needs to be a deep restoration in his soul before there's ever a restoration to position of ministry. And I think something that we don't look at often is that somebody who has been, especially when this is sort of 
uh, a sexual sin that's been hidden for a while, there is a level of deception and a pattern of deception that accompanies that, that is really, really wicked and ingrained. And it takes, you know, I, I, I've talked to people about, you know, changing character flaws. Like spiritually, we can be reconciled to God, like immediately. We confess we're reconciled to God. Changing a character quality or a character flaw, that takes years and years and years. I've heard people say, you know, 10 years should be the minimum that we even consider for something like this. And I, you know, I would be at least, you know, along those lines, I think, I think we should do that uh, 10 years. Again, there's other passages that, that deal with qualifi qualifications of an elder. They're, they're really similar um, to this one. And I think, I, I love that you say this is a privilege. It's a privilege to serve the church. It's a privilege to be in leadership. This is not a birthright. Um, let's talk about there's another pastor <laughs> who uh, got himself in a lot of trouble uh, regarding the Mike Bickle situation, and that's uh, Chris Vallotton, who is at the uh, Bethel Church in Redding, California. Um, he said something in mid-February, which caused a lot of people to be concerned. I'm going to play that clip, and uh, he has since apologized, and we will hear the apology as well. But I want to play the clip first because I think it's important to hear what he said, uh, and because it's, it's not just him. This is such a typical kind of uh, message and response to this kind of sin by another sort of celebrity pastor. We have to break the power of, we need justice. And we have to be people who say, no, we need reconciliation. And by the way, in reconciliation, there is a line of justice. I don't want you to say, you know, I mean, we've just been, you know, I, I'm watching what's happening with IHOP. And by the way, I want to say publicly, I love Mike Bickle. I, I don't know what the outcome will be, but it won't change the fact that I love him. He's my brother. It won't change the fact that he's my brother. Somebody posted on my social page a couple days ago, and they're like, they, they said, oh, you haven't said anything about, you know, the IHOP situation, so you obviously are part of the problem. I'm like... I just, I text, I mean, I wrote back, replied, I wrote, you're an idiot. <laughs> but then I realized that I was the idiot for calling him an idiot, and I had just <laughs> answered a fool according to his foolishness and became a fool right with him, so I immediately took it down. I, I, I'm just pointing out, like, <laughs> if I have a problem with somebody I know I don't need to post something on social media so you all know where I stand. This is not entertainment. This is a tragedy. I'm not going to play out on social media to let you all know, well, you know, I believe that Mike Pickle should do da da and this is the way it should happen. I just want, I just want everybody to know I'm against it too. Listen, if you can't look at my life and know where I stand, I guess I don't have much of a life. My goal for Mike Bickle and IHOP and everyone else who's struggling, including the Bethel struggles we have, is that we would reconcile and that we would see righteousness grow out of it. Yeah. Not another documentary. Yeah. Man, that one just, it, it's hard to listen to. It's hard to watch. I mean, it's, it's one thing to hear the things that he's saying. Um, and to call people idiots who are saying, hey, we need to hear from you. We need to hear from you. Um, and then the cheering and the laughing. Um, and there's other, there's other areas in his sermon, and I know you don't necessarily want to get into that, but, you know, where he talks about you don't need to near, hear the details when there's a fall. Um, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Not every gory detail, but do you need to, you know, I'm so sick of hearing about inappropriate relationships. We don't know if the relationship happened with a, a woman who was a congregant. We don't know the extent of it. We don't know. No, but you know, it's an inappropriate relationship. I mean, come on. Or or they had inappropriate texts, but we can't, we don't know what they are, but, but the elders have looked at them, trust us. No, we don't trust you. We don't trust you anymore because we have seen this over and over and over again of this being mis mishandled. So, um, yeah, it's hard for me. It, it makes me angry. And, you know, people give me a tough time sometimes when I say I'm angry, but, you know, I'm like, why aren't you angry? If this doesn't make you angry on some level, then I think you're missing, uh, you know, God's heart for justice and for victims. Um, 
But I, I'm going to get off my soapbox and I'll let you go, Ron. Um, well, what did you think? When, when I saw that originally, um, mm. I, I was stunned. I was mm. stunned at the laughter. It, it mm. was like comedy hour. Mm. And again, I'm not here to, to, to beat up on, on Chris. I, I've heard many wonderful things about him by people that go uh, to, to Bethel. It's more the principle of... This was just a week, I think, after we discovered that there were allegations from young girls who were teenagers when they were allegedly assaulted by Mike Bickle. And it's not the time that you say, you know what, I'm going to be bold and I'm going to be, I'm going to, you want to know what I think? I love him. There you go. And, and, and calling people who, who wonder where Bethel stands on this, calling them idiots I, I just, I don't understand it. I, I, I wrote about this as soon as I saw it. I was stunned. Um, there was not one mention about these teens, uh, about concern for them. Obviously, they're not teens anymore. There was not concerns for the other victims. And we know that there are other victims that their stories have not come out. I have been told that by uh, those who know in the advocacy group. Uh, th- th- sadly, this story isn't over. So... Um, I do think that uh, leaders of very large movements and congregations do need to take a stand. They need to say, hey, it's fine to say that you love Mike Bickle. I love Mike Bickle. I care for him. I I hope that he fully comes clean and that he gets the healing that he needs, that there is repentance and restitution. Jesus loves Mike Bickle. That's not the issue right now. My deeper issue is not, or I should say this. My deeper concern is not to make sure that the perpetrator knows that I love them, but the victims know that I love them. The Mm -hmm. perpetrator typically, when you're talking about serial abuse, is a narcissist, and he doesn't really care whether I love him or not. He knows he's loved. He feels he's loved by everybody. But the victim, what they have gone through, the shame, the embarrassment, the the years of holding in a secret, how it's affected other relationships, what goes on in a 14-year-old soul? When somebody in their 20s has a sexual relationship, somebody who's married, somebody who's a pastor, that is much more of my concern. So I would hope that in the future that, that, that pastors who have followings like Chris, they would have something to say about the actual sin. I was impressed who others who, who did come forth. And again, like you said, it, it took some time, but said, yes, this is really wrong. This isn't right. And there needs to be a, a, a full confession. So I also know what it's like when you're preaching in front of a large group of people and, and, and they're with you and they, 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 they're listening to you is the, we, we kind of feed off of that. And as you watch mm-hmm. that clip there, you know, the, the people are with him, but that should never be an, an affirmation that what you're saying is truth. Uh, mm-hmm. Because in that moment, they love you. They, they what you say is right. What you say mm-hmm. is truth, but it may not be. And I was deeply disturbed when I saw that. I was happy that a few days later that Chris made somewhat of an apology. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I know you're going to play that, so I won't comment on that right now, but it, it was a disturbing, uh, hurtful uh, thing to see. And I think when we look at scripture, I'm not sure that there's ever, in fact, I'm pretty sure there's not uh, a place where we're encouraged by God to stand with the powerful. It seems like his heart is for the vulnerable, for the victim. And so many of these, you know, I've, I've reported on so many of these cases now. So it's like, you know, very fresh in my memory. But it's it's just shocking to me how often it's, you know, let's pray for, for Mike Bickle. And I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for Mike Bickle. But our first inclination should be, let's pray for the victims. Man, these women for decades have 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 been silenced. Often they've tried to come forward and people don't believe them and they gaslight them and they make them the problem instead of the real problem. I mean, this is the real situation. And so I just, you know, church, please, please, please do better and do not encourage pastors when they're, when they're doing this, because it's, it's just, it's wrong. It's, it's not the heart of God at all. Yeah. The cry of the Hebrew prophets was often against injustice towards the weak. It was never to praise the strong. Yep, exactly. Well, we, we've mentioned this apology, so I, I do want to play Chris's apology that uh, he came out with, and, and I do appreciate it, um, but here it is. 
Hi, I'm Chris Valentin. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to apologize and say I'm very sorry for a message that hurt a lot of people in that I did not talk about the protection of victims in the streaming service. I actually did talk about it. I preached four times and talked about it in the other three services, but somehow missed it completely, which is a big mistake. And also talked about the situation with IHOP, which there's so much pain in that situation, and I just add it to that pain, and I'm so very sorry. I think the victims absolutely need to be protected as a first priority, and I would never blame a victim for what happens in a situation like that. Secondly, my message was about the idea and the concept that we have so many leaders falling into immorality, and I was calling for leaders to be held accountable, don't matter if they're my friends, don't matter how long I've known them. The message was about the fact that in order to get out of sin, you need transparency, you need confession, you need the blood of Jesus, and you need fellowship. You have to walk in the light according to 1 John. That was the heart of my message. That was the message I was preaching. And unfortunately, the whole thing uh, got con misconstrued to some, to some folks, and I understand how they would get that. If you've only heard the two-minute clip, I would really ask you to go back and watch the entire message. I don't know if that will solve um, maybe your, your concerns, but that was the message. Leaders need to be held accountable, and they have to stop living a, a, aloof, in isolation and without accountability. Thank you very much. I hope you forgive me. So, appreciate appreciate the. I mean, it's a different. You're hearing a very different tone there, uh, much more contrite right. than you heard in the sermon. Uh, what did you make of that apology? Uh, I, I appreciated it. Um, I was moved by it. I deleted mm -hmm. my post after I saw it. I think it could have been a little bit stronger if he had mentioned. The, the names, even though we, we don't, the, the names are not in public, Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 2, uh, uh, Tammy Woods, and TH, just to say, uh, we're, we're praying for you, we love you, mm -hmm. we're sorry that you, you went through this, but, but I thought he, he was contrite and broken, and I, and I don't want to sit here as a judge over his apology, that's really not my role, but, but I do appreciate that he quickly took responsibility. Yeah, um... I, I think, I mean, I do think we need to get a little better at apologies and not try to <laughs> make excuses uh, at them. Uh, I know Wade Mullen talks about the faux apology, and um, and, I, and I think we do need to, to think about how we make them. I, I went back and I listened to his message. It, I didn't listen to the whole entire thing, so I'll say that, but um, the parts I heard didn't make it better for me. Um, but you know, maybe some folks will, will listen to it and, and, and find that it makes it better. The thing that really concerns me is that on March 12th, Chris put out the following right. uh, post on Twitter uh, or X now. I'm going to quote it. Redemption isn't just for victims. It's for victimizers. The Lord doesn't just restore the innocent. He restores the guilty. The woman caught in adultery wasn't a person having sex outside of marriage, but a woman cheating on her husband and having sex with a husband that belongs to another wife. She is not a victim. She is a victimizer. The message of the gospel is not just for those sinned against, but for the sinner. If justice in Christ means the sinner gets what he deserves, then the gospel is only for victims, the innocent, the already righteous, innocent victims, children, the weak, the broken, the aged, and so on must first and foremost be protected from victimizers, and their restoration must be prioritized when they are sinned against. You don't have to be a Christian to call for justice for victims, but to call for and long for redemption of the guilty. That's a Christ-like attribute. It's important to remember that everyone in the world who is a victim of a crime is also a victimizer in life that needs redemption from sin and forgiveness from Christ. Yeah, I am... Um... I, I don't, the, the timing of that was very strange. Um, yeah. Why now? And I wrote, I, I wrote, um, you know, I, I uh, agree with the message, but timing re really bad when we're dealing with uh, predatory behavior of one of the most famous charismatic names in the entire world. <clears throat> you're saying that victims are victimizers or that we need to be concerned about the victimizers. It, it just, I, I, timing, not a good time for that message. And by the way, the woman caught in adultery, mm -hmm. uh, many manuscripts don't even have that in it. I don't know how he knows the background of that woman. 
it's certainly not in the text. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's some assumptions being made, and, mm -hmm. and some people believe that the Holy Spirit gives them instructions on the background story. I don't believe that we should be doing that in theology. Um, but we don't know the story of the woman caught in the, caught in adultery. We do know something that the man caught in adultery wasn't there. Some, some, something happened to him for some reason they didn't bring him forward. And, um, Jesus was very compassionate with her, but, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a strange t tweet. Well, and one thing we do know is it was a pretty patriarchal culture where women didn't necessarily have the rights that men had. Right. And, and a woman could easily be caught in adultery and it be, I mean, a, a power situation where she wasn't really consensual partner. So we, we really don't know. Um, and I think, again, it's, it is stunning to me that that is the message that, that he came out with now. It's almost, I don't mean to interrupt you, but it's almost like saying in the present situation, you Jane Doe's, you teenage girls, don't forget, you're also a victimizer. And I, I can't agree with that. I, it's, it's pretty stunning. It, it is pretty stunning. Yeah. Um, are we all sinners? 100%. 100%. And should that make us gracious? 100%. But right now, that message, that's pretty tough. Pretty tough. Um, I want to go to Matthew 18, because I, I do not want to, to <laughs> end this podcast yes. without touching on this passage, which has been used to tell, for example, Jane Doe that she needed to come and confront Mike Bickle. Uh, fortunately, her husband stood in for her, which still, I mean, pretty difficult situation for a husband to do as well. Um, but let, let me just read it. Um, and then let's talk about how this is being used because it is being used in churches for uh, as though this is a prescription for how you should deal with a sin and elder. Let me read Matthew 18. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two or you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them for, uh, by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Okay, so this is being used as not, not only if... Um, somebody assaults you or sins against you. But even if you see sin in an elder that doesn't relate to even you, that mm -hmm. this is the prescription, you have to go to him one-on-one uh, -on -one, or her, it could be a her. Uh, is that, what's the applic the right application of this verse? Yeah. yeah, I think most scholars would agree that that is talking about personal offenses. It's not talking about rape. It's not talking about uh, uh clergy sexual abuse. It's not talking about sex with teens or with children. Mm -hmm. uh, I know of one uh, congregation, mega church, uh, that when there were, when there was criminal behavior, and I believe in that state, you were required if somebody of age was with a child in the children's ministry, that you would have to report that to the police. And what they would do is they would bring the child and the abuser together for reconciliation, which is just mm -hmm. nutty. It is just so wrong. And of course, that was based on Matthew 18. Um, no, I do not think that Jesus is telling a vulnerable, powerless young lady that you go to the senior pastor of a mega church or a mega ministry and you confront him because he raped you or you confront him because he manipulated you into sexual sin. I, I, I don't buy that for a minute. And I think uh, that sometimes people will use that as, as a way of avoiding, you can't confront me because I didn't sin against you. If she wants to confront me, you tell her to, that, that, you know, come on, grow up, be a leader, be a man. Uh, if God forbid it was my wife being the victim, you better believe that I would not send her back to confront. I would be there and, and it might not be pretty. Um, 
you know, God bless the husband of Jane Doe that he did not send his wife to confront Mike Bickle, but went himself. Uh, uh, but that was used, as I understand it, from what I understand about the situation, that was constantly used as a way to, to cry foul. Now, listen, there are some times that we mess up in confrontations. I've been in high profile co- confrontations where I've made mistakes, where I've done the wrong thing. The, the, you cannot cry foul because you made a technic, a mistake in a technicality. And therefore we're going to ignore adultery. We're going to ignore rape. We're going to ignore the abuse of interns because you failed on point two. <laughs> we're often going to get these things wrong. The bigger issue is the moral failure is the crime is the rape is the adultery, etc. I am so tired of this you of this passage being used really to bully and manipulate vulnerable people when they try to come forward. And I love that you say, you know, we, we don't sit there and, you know, let's nitpick at the victim and how they, they did this or the whistleblower, because again, this is talking about a personal offense. It's not talking about a, a person in spiritual leadership who's mishandling that leadership. There should be a way of reporting that without the vulnerable person, which again, anybody in a congregation Anybody on staff who's been below the pastor is a vulnerable person, and there right. should be a way to report that. And again, I think uh, passages like 1 Timothy 5, uh, 19 and 20 are much more applicable than this, which deals with you know, a personal right. offense. I, I can remember once being in a church meeting and them saying, if you have some thoughts about something, to, to, to speak them. And so I stood up and I, I spoke them, and I learned firsthand the power of the man with the mic in front of the Mm -hmm. entire church, the way I was shamed, the way I was, you know, which actually ended up backfiring because it's like, oh my word, did he just treat her like that? But again, these are the sorts of things that we are doing so poorly within the church. We were in a situation a few years ago where there was a, somebody who I believe is a predator um, and there were whistleblowers with, that, that had been in his organization and they went to the person to whom he was accountable. And that person would not meet with him. He would not meet with him. He would not hear the elegant. And they were the worst sexual sins I've ever seen. And not only would he not meet with him, he then publicly, when they finally made the the Mm -hmm. evidence public, he said what they did is worse than the sexual perversion of the person they were accusing. That's just bad leadership. As leaders, if there are these accusations, allegations of severe sexual sin. Number one, no, you don't have to go to the person first. You should go straight to leadership. And number two, we should be beyond the world. In the world, you have a human resources department in most corporations where you would not have to go to the CEO or the vice president. You would go to human resources and they would protect you. Mm-hmm. And why is it that we can not protect people in the body of Christ, but unbelievers can do it in corporations? Instead, we're going to send them as sheep to wolves to the very person that perpetrated against them in the first place. That's just not biblical. It's not right. And it's not protective. Mm, Preach. (laughs) Preach. Uh, I so believe that passionately that needs to happen. Uh, And and one of the things I will say, and I, I think we'll end here, I have been heartened in this all uh, International House of Prayer scandal involving Mike Bickle. And I, I'm trying to think of another situation. I mean, in almost all the stories and investigations I've done, there's there are people who used to be on staff uh, who are, or who used to be in leadership who come forward and often become my main sources. Rarely have I seen, and I don't know that I've ever seen the kind of organized group where you have former leaders who say, you know, investigate these things and then actually stand on the front lines for these women. And they yeah. took the hits first. I mean, the advocates who came out and made a public statement uh, in late October saying, you know, we are convinced there are credible uh, accounts of Mike Bickle having this predatory pattern, you know, sinning sexually against these women. Um and preying on them. Uh, I mean, they took the hits initially and they even right. from, you know, I remember when General Fuller called some of them liars and really went after them and they were willing 
to stand, you know, we talk a lot about men standing in the gap, you know, and, and, and I, I'm not going to make a statement about, you know, patriarchy or, you know, complementarian egalitarianism. I'm, I'm not trying to say that, but I, I will say this. I am sick and tired of men talking about being leaders and what that means. And when it comes to standing in the gap for women and taking the hits for them, I hardly ever see them do it. But in this case, I did. And I would say yeah. thank you to those men, Dwayne Roberts and Alan Hood. And there are women involved in that, too. You know, Elizabeth uh, Herter and, and others who have just really, really done incredible work. But that, to me, is one of the most heartening things that I have seen. And I just think those those men and women deserve our our support and really our, yeah. our gratitude. Yeah, I, I'll just uh, amen to everything you just said there. I, I know several people on the advocacy group. Um, some have been friends. Some uh, are new friends. Uh, Dwayne Roberts and I are going to be in Brazil in, in May ministering together on this topic. Um, and I know what it's like to be in that position where we had to confront a high-profile pro person a few years ago. And you're, you're putting your entire res reputation on the line. It's very mm -hmm. scary. And you don't know which way it's going to go. And, 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 I, and in the midst of it, it looks like it's going the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Your life is over. Everybody hates you. Everyone's against you. And I'm just so proud of them that they had the courage to bring this forward and that they didn't back down mm -hmm. when, when it, it did look like the, you know, things were just going to be washed away and pushed away. And so God bless them. May God minister to them uh, because they took some arrows in the spirit. That, that is a very wounding thing that you go through when people are suddenly talking about you online, using your name, challenging your character. So, so God bless them and may God minister life and grace to them. Yeah. And I would say that to you as well, because Ron, you've stood out there and I know, uh, I know that makes you uh, it's kind of a lightning rod when you say something, but I've appreciated that and I appreciate your, your candor on this podcast. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks so much for listening to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's. And just a quick reminder, The Roy's Report is dependent on donations from listeners like you to continue our work. So if you appreciate podcasts like these, as well as our investigative journalism, would you please help support us this month? Again, we don't have big advertisers or big donors. We just have you, the people who care about rooting out the corruption and abuse in the church. So if you're passionate about our vision to report the truth and restore the church, please go to julieroys, spelled R-O-Y-S, dot com slash donate, and you can give there. Again, that's julieroys, dot com slash donate. Also, just a quick reminder to subscribe to The Roy's Report on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. That way, you won't miss any of these episodes. And while you're at it, I'd really appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word about the podcast by leaving a review. And then, please share the podcast on social media so more people can hear about this great content. Again, thanks so much for joining me. Hope you were blessed and encouraged.